guys, today I'm going to be reading the fifth chapter for the school and for good in it. Chapter 5. Boys Ruin Everything. Each school had its own entrance to the theater of tales, which was split into two halves. The west doors opened into the side for the good students, decorated with pink and blue pews, crystal phrases, phrases, and glittering bouquets of glass flowers. The east doors opened into the side for evil students, which warped wooden benches, carved carving of murder, carvings of murder and torture, and deadly stalactites dangling from the burnt ceiling. As students herded into their halves for the welcoming, fairies and wolves guarded the silver marble aisle between them. Despite her ghastly new uniform, Sophie had no intention of sitting with Ebo. So this is a picture of one look at the good girls glossy hair dazzling smiles chick pink dresses and she knew she had found her sisters if the fairies wouldn't rescue her surely her fellow princesses would with with, with villains sho shoving her along she tried to get the girls the good girls attention but they were ignoring her side of the theater. Finally, Sophie batted, battled her way to the aisle, waving her arms and opened her mouth to yell when a hand, hand, when a hand yanked her under a ro rotted bench. Agatha tackled her in a hug. I found the schoolmaster's tower. It's, it's in the moat and there's guards, but if we can just get up there, then we can... Hi, nice to see you. Give me your clothes, said Sophie staring at Agatha's pink dress. Huh? Quick, it will stop, solve everything. You can't be serious. Sophie, we can't stay here. Exactly, Sophie smiled. I need to be in your school and you need to be in mine. Just like we talked about, remember? But your father, my mother, my cat. Agatha, sp Agatha sputtered. You don't know what they're like here. They'll turn us into snakes or squirrels or shrubbery. Sophie, we have to get back home. Why? What do I have in Galveston to go back to? Sophie said. Agatha blushed with hurt. You have, um, you have, right, nothing. Now, my dress, please. Agatha folded her arms. Then I'll take it myself. Sophie scowled. But her right, but right as she grabbed Agatha by, by her flowered sleeve, Something made her stop cold. Sophie, listen, ears peaked and took off like a panther. She slid under warped benches, dodging vill dodged villains' feet, ducked behind the last pew, and peeked around it. Agatha followed, exasperated. I don't know what's gotten into you. Sophie covered Agatha's mouth and listened to the sounds growing lo grow louder. Sounds that made every girl... Every good girl bolt up upright. Um, sounds that they had waited their whole lives to hear. From the hall, the stomp of boots, the clash of steel. The west doors flew open to sixty gorgeous boys in sw in sword fight. Sun kissed skin peeked through the light blue sleeves and stiff collars. Tall navy boots matched high cut waistcoats and not knotted slim ties, each embroidered with a single gold initial. As the boys playfully crossed blades, their shirts came untucked from tight beige breeches, revealing slender waists and flashes of muscle. Sweat glistens, glistened on glowing faces as they thrust down the, the aisle. Boots crackled on marble until swiftly the sword fight climaxed. Boys pinning boys against pews in a, in a last chorus of movement, movement. They drew roses from their shirts and, without a shout of milady, threw them to girls who most caught their eye. Beatrix found herself with enough roses to plant a garden. Agatha watched 
uh, all this seasick. But when she saw Sophie, heart and throat, longing for her own rose in the de decayed pews, the villains booed to the princess, brandishing banners with never's rule and ever stink. Ex except for a weasel-faced faced Hort, who crossed his arms sulkily and mumbled, Why do they get their own entrance? With a bow, the princes blew kisses to villains and prepared to take their seats, when the west door suddenly slammed open again, and one more walked in. Hair a halo of celestial gold, eyes blue as a cloudless sky, skin the color of, a, of hot desert sand, and glistened like a noble sheen, as if his blood ran purer than the rest, the stranger took one look at took one look at the frowning sword armed boys, pulled his own sword, and grinned. Forty boys came at him at once, but he disarmed each with lightning speed. The swords of his classmate piled up beneath his feet as he flicked them away without inflicting a scratch. Sophie gaped, bewitched, at the hope. She, he'd impale himself, but no such luck, for the boy dismissed each new challenge as qu quickly as it came. The embroidered tee on his blue tie glinting with each dance of his blade, and then the, and, and when the last had been left swordless and dumbstruck, he sheathed, he sheathed his own sword and struggled, as if to say. He meant nothing by it all, but the boys of good knew what it meant. The princes, the princes now had a king. Even the villains couldn't find reason to boo. Meanwhile, the good girls had long learned that every true princess finds a prince, so, so no need to fight each other. But they forgot all this when the golden boy pulled a rose from his shirt. All of them jumped up, waving kerchiefs jostling like geese at a feeding. The boy smiled and wafted his rose high in the air. Agatha saw Sophie move too late. She ran after her, but Sophie dashed into the aisle, leapt over the pink pews, lunged for the rose, and caught a wolf instead. As it dragged Sophie back to her side, she locked eyes with the boy, who, looked, who took in her fair face, then her horrid black robes, and cocked his head, baffled. Then he saw Agatha, agog in pink. His rose plopped in her open palm and recoiled in shock. As the wolf dumped Sophie with evil and fairies shoved Agatha with good, the boy gawked wide-eyed, trying to make sense of it all. Then a hand pulled him into a seat. Hi, I'm Beatrix, she said, and made sure he saw all of her roses. From the evil seat, Sophie tried to get his attention. Turn yourself in, into a mirror, then you'll have a chance. Sophie turned to Hester, sitting next to her. Hi. His name is Tedros, her roommate said, and he's just as stuck up as his father. Sophie was about to ask who his father was, but then glimpsed his sword, dazzling silver with the hilt of diamonds, a sword with a lion crest she knew from storybooks a sword named excalibur he's king arthur's son sophie breathed she studied tedros's high cheekbones silky blonde hair and thick tender lips his broad shoulders and strong arms filled out his blue shirt tie loosened and collar undone he looked so serene and assured as if he knew destiny was on his side Gazing at him, Sophie felt her own destiny destiny lock into place. He's mine. Suddenly, she felt a hot glare across the aisle. We're going home, Agatha mouthed clearly. Welcome to school for good and evil, said the nicer of the two heads. From their seats in opposite, on opposite sides of the aisle, Sophie and Agatha tracked the massive dog with two heads attached to a single body, pacing across a silver stone stage. Cracked down, cracked down the middle, one head was rabid, drooling in male, with a grisly mane. The other head was cuddly and cute, with a weak jaw 
scanty fur and sing-song voice. No one was sure if the cuter head was male or female, but whatever, but whatever it was, it seemed to be in charge. I'm Pollux, welcome, welcoming leader, said the nice head, and I'm Castor, welcoming leader, assist, and I'm Castor, welcoming leader, assistant, and exec, and executive exec, execution. Executive executioner of punishment for anyone who breaks rules or acts like a donkey, the rabid one boomed. All the children looked scared of Castor, even the villains. Thank you, Castor, said Pollux. So let me remind you why it is you're here. All the children are born with souls that are either good or evil. Some souls are purer than, the, uh, than others. And some souls are crap, Castor barked. As I was saying, said Pollux, some souls are purer than others, but all souls are fundamentally good or evil. Those who are evil cannot make their souls good, and those who are good cannot make their souls evil. So just so just because good is good and everything doesn't mean you can switch sides, snarled, snarled Castor. The good students cheered, Evers, Evers. Evil students retorted, nevers, nevers, before wolves doused evers with water buckets. Fairies, before wolves doused evers with water buckets, and fairy, fairies cast rainbows over the nevers, and both eyes shut up. Once again, said Pollux tightly, those who are evil cannot be good, and those who are good cannot be evil. Those who are evil cannot be good, and those who are good cannot be evil. No matter how much you're persuaded or punished, now, so, now sometimes you may feel the stirring of both, but this just means your family tree has branches where good and evil have toxically mixed. But, there, he, but here at the School for Good and Evil, we will rid you of stirrings. We will rid you of confusion. We will try to make you as pure as possible. And if you fail, then and if you fail, then something is so bad will happen to you that I can't say. But it, but it involves you never being seen again. One more, and it's the muzzle. Pollux yelled. Castor stared at his toes. None of these brilliant students will fail, I'm sure. Pollux smiled at the relieved children. You say that every time, and then someone fails. Castor mumbled. So he remembered. Bane's scared face on the wall and shuddering and shuddered. She had to get to good soon. Every child in the endless woods dreams of being picked to attend our school, but the schoolmaster chose you, said Pollock, scanning both sides, for he looked into your hearts and saw something very rare, pure good and pure evil. If we're so pure, then what's that? An impish blonde boy with spiky ears stood from evil and pointed to Sophie. A, bur a burly boy from good pointed to Agatha. We have one, too. Ours smells like flowers, yelled a villain. Ours ate, uh, ours ate a fairy. Ours smiles too much. Ours farted in our face. Sophie turned to Agatha, aghast. Every class, we bring two readers here from the woods beyond, Pollux declared. They may know our world from pictures and books, but they know our rules just as well as you. They have the same talents and goals, the same potential for glory, and they have too have and they too have been some of our finest students. Like two hundred years ago, Castor snorted. There are no different they are no different than the rest of you, Pollux said. Defensively, they look different than the rest of us, cracked an oily, brown-skinned villain. S students from both schools murmured in agreement. Sophie stared down, stared down Agatha as if to say this could all be solved with a simple costume change. Do not question the schoolmaster's selections, said Pollux. All of you will respect each other, whether you're good or evil. Whether you're from a famous fairy tale or or a failed one, whether you're you're a sired prince or a reader, all of you are cho chosen 
to protect the balance between good and evil, for once that balance is compromised, his face darkened. Our world will perish. A hush, a hush fell over the hall. Agatha grimaced. The last thing she needed was this world perishing while they were still in it. Castor raised his paw. paw. What? Paul exclaimed. Why does evil win? Why doesn't evil win anymore? Pollux looked like he was about to bite his. Pollux looked like he was about to bite his head off, but it was too late. The l villains were rumbling. Yeah, if we're so balanced, yelled Hort. Why do we always die? We never get good weapons, shouted the impish boy. Our henchmen betray us. Our nemesis always has an army. Castor stood. Evil hasn't won in two hundred years. Castor tried to control himself, but his red face swelled like a balloon. Good is cheating. Never slept up in mutiny, mutiny, hurling food, shoes, and anything else at hand at horrified Evers. Sophie slunk down in her seat. Tredros couldn't possibly think she was one of these ugly hooligans, could he? She peeked over the bench and caught him staring right at her. Sophie pinked. Sophie pinked and ducked back down. Wolves and fairies pounced on the angry horde around her, but this time rainbows and water couldn't stop them. The schoolmaster, the schoolmaster's on their side, Esther screamed. We don't even have a chance, howled Hort. The Nevers fought past fairies and wolves and charged the Evers pews. It's because you're idiotic apes. The villains looked up dumbly. Now sit down before I give all of you a slap, shrieked Pollux. They sat with ar without argument, except Anadol's rat, who peeked from her pocket and hissed. Pollux scowled down at the villains. Maybe if you stopped complaining, you'd produce someone of consequence. But all we hear is excuse after excuse. Have you produced one decent villain since the Great War? One villain capable of defeating their nemesis? No wonder readers come here confused. No wonder they want to be good. Sophie saw kids on both sides of the aisle sneak her sympathetic glances. Students, all of you have only, have only one concern here, Pollock said, softening. Do the best work you can. The finest of you will become princes and, princes and warlocks, knights and witches, queens and sorcerers. Or a troll or a pig if you stink, Castor spat. S students glanced at each other across the aisle, sensing the high stakes. So if there are no future interruptions, Pollock said, glowering at his brother, let's review the rules. Rule 13. Halfway bridge and tower roofs are forbidden to students, Pollux lectured on stage. The gargoyles have, or have orders to kill intruders on site and have yet to grasp their difference, di difference between students and intruders. Sophie found all of this dull, so she tuned out and stared at Tedros instead. She had never seen a boy so clean. Boys in Gavildon smelled like hogs and slow, and slapped around with chapped lips, ch yellow teeth, and black nails. But Tedros had heavenly tan skin dabbed with light stubble and no hint, no chance of a blemish. Even after the vigorous sword fight, he every last gold, gold hair fell in place. When he licked his lips, white teeth gleamed through his gleamed in perfect rows. Sophie watched a trickle of sweat crisscross his neck and vanish beneath his shirt. What does he smell like? She closed her eyes like fr fresh wood and she opened her eyes and saw Beatrix st stub stubbly sniffing Tredros's hair. This girl needed to be dealt with immediately. A, he a headless bird landed in Sophie's dress. She jumped on her seat screaming and shaking her tunic until the dead canary plopped to the floor. She recognized the bird with a frown, then noticed the entire hall gaping at her. She gave her best princess courtesy and sat back down. As I was saying, Pollock said testily, 
Sophie wiped, looked at Agatha. What? She mouthed. We need to meet, Agatha mouthed back. My clothes, Sophie mouthed and turned back to, to the stage. Esther and Anadil looked at the decapitated bird, then at Agatha. Her, we like, and Anadil quipped. Rats squeaked in agreement. Your first year will consist of required courses. Um, your first year will consist of required courses to prepare you for three major tests. The trial by tail, the circus of talents, and the snowball. Castor growled. After the first year, you will be divided into three t tracks. One for villain and for hero leaders. One for henchmen and helper followers, and one for mo mogriffs, or those that will undergo transformation. For the next two years, leaders will train to find, to fight their future nemesis, or their future nemesis, Pollock said. Followers will develop skills to defend their future leaders. Mogriffs will learn to adapt to their new forms and survive in the treacherous woods. Finally, after the third year, learn... Leaders will be prepared with followers and mogriffs, and you will all move into the Endox Woods to begin your journeys. Sophie tried to pay attention, but couldn't with Beatrix, practically in Tedros's lap. Fuming, Sophie picked up, picked at her glittering silver swan crest. Glittering silver swan crest stitched on her smelly smock. It was the only tolerable tall, thing about it. Now as to how to we determine our your future tracks. We do not give marks here at the School for Good and Evil, said Pollux. Instead, for every test or challenge, you will be ranked within your classes so you know exactly where you stand. There are 120 students in each school, and we have decided and we have divided you into six groups of 20 for your classes. After each challenge, you will be ranked from 1 to 20. If you are ranked in the top 5 in your group, consistently you will end up on the leader the leader track. If you score in the mid-range repeatedly, you'll end up a follower. And if you consistently if you're consistently below a 13, then your talents will be best served as a mogriff, either animal or plant. Students on both aisles murmured, already placing bets on who would end end up a tumbo tree. I must add that anyone who receives three twenties in a row will immediately be failed, said Pollux gravely. As I said, given the expectational incompetence required to earn three straight last place ranks, I am confident this rule will not apply to any of you. The nevers in her row through Sophia look. When they put me where I belong, you'll all feel foolish, won't you? Sophie shot back. Your swan crest will be visible in your heart at all times, Pollux continued. Any attempt to conceal or remove it will likely result in injury or embarrassment, so please refrain. refrain. Confused, Sophie watched students on both sides trying to cover the glittering sw silver swans on their uniform, mimicly Mimicking them, she folded the droopy collar over her tunic to obscure her own swan. Instantly, the crest vanished off the robe and appeared on her chest. Um, stunned, she ran her finger over the swan, but it was Im embedded in her skin like a tattoo. She released the fold and the swan vanished off her skin and reappeared on the rope. Sophie frowned, perhaps not so tolerable after all. Furthermore, more as the theater of tales is in good this year, Nevers will be escort escorted here for all joint school functions, said Pollux. Otherwise, you must remain in your schools at all times. Why is the theater in good? Dot hollered through a mouthful of fudge. Pollux raised his nose. Whoever wins the Circus of t Talents gets the theater in their school. And Good hasn't lost a circus or trial by tail or, now that I think about it, any competition at this school for the last 200 years. Castor harumphed.
Villain started rumbling again. But good is so far from evil, Dot huffed. Heaven forbid she has to walk, Sophie mumbled. Dot heard and glowered at her. Sophie cursed herself, the only person who was civil to her, and she had to ruin it. Pollux ignored the never's grumbles and droned on about for a few times, lulling half the room to sleep. Rena raised her hand. Are gloom rooms open yet? All of a sudden, the Evers looked awake. Well, I was planning to discuss groom rooms next assembly, Pollock said. Is it true that only certain kids can use them? asked Millicent. Pollock sighed. Groom rooms in the good towers are only available to Evers ranked in the top half of their classes on any given day. Rankings will be posted on the groom room doors and throughout the castle. Please do not abuse Albemaro if he's behind on posting them. Now, as to curfew rules, why, what are groom rooms, Sophie whispered to Hester, where Evers primp, preen, and get their hair done, Hester sh- shuddered. Sophie sprang up. Do we have a groom room? Do we have groom rooms? Pollux pursed his lips. Nevers have doom rooms, dear. Where we get our hair done, Sophie beamed. Where you're beaten and tortured, Pollock said. Sophie sat down. Now curfew will occur at precisely... Now curfew will occur at precisely... How do you become class captain, Hester asked. The question... The question and the presumption's tone behind it instantly made her unpopular on both sides of the aisle. If you all flunk your few inspections, don't blame me, Pollux groaned. All right, after the trial by tail, the top ranked students would rank students in each school will be na- named class captain. These two students will have special privileges, including private study with select facility, field trips into the endless woods, and the Chance to train with renowned heroes and villains, as you know, our captains have gone on to be some of the greatest legends in the endless woods. While both sides buzzed, Sophie gritted her teeth. She knew if she could just get to the right school, she'd not only be Good's captain, she'd end up more famous than Snow White. This year, you will have six required classes in your individual schools, Pollux went on. The seventh class surviving fairy tales will include both good and evil and takes place in the blue forest behind the schools also please note both beautification and etiquette are for good girls only while good boys will have grooming and chivalry chivalry instead agatha woke from her stupor if she didn't have enough reason to escape the thought of beautification class was the last straw. She had to get out of here tonight. She turned to an adorable girl next to her with narrow, narrow brown eyes and short black hair, fixing her lipstick in a pocket mirror. Mind if I borrow your lipstick, Agatha asked. The girl took one look at Agatha's ashy, cracked lips and thrust it at her. Keep it. Breakfast and su- and supper will take place in your school supper halls, but you'll all eat lunch together in the clearing, Castor grunted. That is, if you're mature enough to handle the privilege. Sophie felt her heart race. If the schools uh, ate their lunches together, tomorrow would be her first chance to talk to Tedros. What would she say to him, and how would she get rid of the beastly Beatrix? The endless woods beyond the school gates are barred to first-year students, said Pollux, and though the rule may fall on deaf's ear, deaf ears for the most adventurous of you, let me remind you of the most important rule of all, one that will cost you your lives if you, ha- if you fail to obey. Snow- Sophie snapped to attention. Never go into the woods after dark, said Pollux. His cuddly smile returned. You may return to your schools. Supper is at seven o'clock sharp. As Sophie rose with the Nevers, mentally rehearsing her lunch meeting with Tedros, a voice ripped through 
the chatter. How do you, how do we see the schoolmaster? The hall went dead silence. Students turned shell shocked. Agatha stood alone in the aisle, glaring up at Castor and Pollux. The twin headed dog jumped off the stage and landed a foot from her, splashing her with drool. Both heads glared into Agatha's eyes, wearing the same ferocious expression. It wasn't clear who was who. You don't, they growled. As fairies whisked flailing Agatha to the east door, she passed Sophie from for an instant, just long enough to thrust out a rose petal uh, a rose petal marred by a lipstick message. Bridge nine PM But Sophie never saw it. Her eyes were locked on Tedros, a hunter stalking its prey, until she was shoved from the hall by villains. Right then and there, the problem smashed Agatha in the face, the one that had plagued them all along. For as the two girls were pulled to their opposite towers, their, oppos- the, their opposing desire couldn't have been clear. Agatha wanted her only friend back, but a friend wasn't enough for Sophie. Sophie had always wanted more. Sophie wanted a prince. So that ends chapter 5 of the school for good in it.